Hello, hello. So um, three things before I get started, right? First one, uh, thank you to Sunny and team to having me here today. It's, it's really a, a great pleasure to be with you all. Second thing, um, I'm the last hurdle before lunch, right? So uh, bear with me. Uh, I hope to make it reasonably interesting. Um, and, and please stick around. The third thing, and this kind of leads into my presentation, um, we have heard a lot about sustainability today and how blockchain can help with the topic of sustainability. But we haven't heard much yet about how to think about the sustainability characteristics of blockchains themselves. So that's kind of what I want to do with you today. Okay? So these are really my, this is my little agenda. I want to talk briefly about two investment trends. Then I want to talk about how to assess sustainability of blockchains and um, share a little bit about some recent research that we've been doing with um, a few uh, fellow scholars. And then wrap it up. Uh, I don't think we have time for Q&A, um, but I'll stick around so we'll, we'll, we'll get the chance to converse a little bit. So let me start with the, these two trends that I just mentioned. The first one is, of course, sustainability, no surprise. I'm showing you on this slide, a, uh, on the x-axis, of course, time, on the y-axis, two numbers. One is um, total amount of assets under management in sustainability funds, and on the right-hand side, the number of total funds. Yeah? So you can see it's about 6,000 funds that manage over $2.5 trillion in AUM. Uh, that's about 2.5 times the total market capitalization of the crypto market today. And um, as you can see, Europe is kind of the leader. Uh, US follows, Asia is a little bit behind. So some people argue that sustainability is a scam. Uh, there's a, a very prominent person from um, HSBC, and he came out, it's, it's basically all uh, a hoax. Um, I think. Of course, it's not. But um, what I do think is very bad is greenwashing. I'm sure you heard the term greenwashing. You know, basically using sustainability um, as a means of marketing. So that is something that I, I personally really don't subscribe to. Um, I also believe that rather than only characterizing uh, companies or, or blockchain platforms the same way a credit rating agency uh, does is not the right approach to think about ESG or sustainability. Rather, I think the better approach is to think about it um, like research of an equity analyst, right? The analyst in Goldman Sachs might say this company is a buy, and the one in, in Morgan Stanley might say it's a sell. And why can they have different, different, um, op different views on the same data that they look at? Well, because they might have different preferences, right? And this is the same thing with ESG. Um, some of the preferences will determine which parts of the ESG framework we find more important. Um, in the blockchain space, everything is more complicated because there is no standard to analyze these sustainability characteristics. But I do think that we can use sustainability characteristics to assess who's going to win in the long term. And I'll talk more about that in a second. The second trend that you're all probably very familiar with, otherwise you probably wouldn't be in this room, is uh, crypto, right? So our total market capitalization as of yesterday, I don't know whether it changed much, is about a trillion. Um, we see that this incredible um, pace of innovation, right? So many new ideas popping up left, right, and center. But we also have to acknowledge that the adoption of uh, crypto-based platforms is close to zero, right? That's something that always offends people in um, at crypto events, but it's really true. You think about the biggest platforms that we know today, right? OpenSea or uh, Uniswap, right? These, these are kind of household names. Everyone knows about them. They have about, I don't know what, 20,000 daily active users. Do you know how many daily active users WhatsApp has? 500 million. Okay, so you can tell that adoption is really not there. Huh? All right. I want to also highlight, and I think Renato mentioned it earlier a little bit, we can't use sustainability characteristics that we apply to companies or the firm and say the same thing goes for, for blockchain platforms. 
because they're different, they're different beasts, right? So I tried to depict this a little bit. Um, you have, in the traditional case, a company that is owned by shareholders, managed by an executive management team, and then you have some sort of operational capacity that effectively creates a product and sells it to the customer, right? And these three parts, the shareholders, the organization, and the customer, are quite separate from each other, normally. Now, in the blockchain world, you know, we're not-for-profit entity, mostly. We're often we're, we're a foundation. We chain also as a foundation. And then different matters uh, seem, seem to be relevant, right? So we have, on the one side, the technology stack. Uh, we also have how incentives are being designed into the system. And then, last but not least, we have the community, right? And in the community, you have people who build, people who build businesses on top of the platforms, uh, people who consume. Yeah? So it's a little bit more blurry than in the traditional um, company context. Um, what I want to focus on today is a little bit the, the discussion of sustainability of smart contract platforms, or some people call them layer one platforms. Right? And I think about them as operating systems for Web3. Okay? So similar to Windows or Unix, uh, that is basically creating you basic infrastructure so that you can build something on top. Um, the tokens that power these platforms are really designed, this is very important actually, are really designed to be spent on the platform, yeah? to, be, to be paying for infrastructure services. They're not really designed as investment products. Yeah? Very important. But at the same time, if, you, if I put my fund manager hat on, the interesting way to get exposure to the cryptocurrency markets in a kind of a macro way, because um, buying them helps you get exposure to something that is not committed to a particular use case. Yeah? Anything can be built on top of it. All right. Now, why is this all important? Why, why, why do sustainability characteristics of layer one chains really matter? Well, if you move somewhere new, you're going to research the neighborhood. If you buy a car, you're going to understand more about the car. So if you pick a blockchain to build on, of course, you want to do research because you create, effectively, a bit of a dependency to that platform for your system, right? And you'll be bounded by some of the characteristics that that operating system has. So eventually, if you pick the right platform for your use case, you will be able to decrease the risk of your, uh, of your platform failing. But there's also a reason uh, and again, I'm, I'm speaking a little bit from an investor perspective here, um, why this matters for investors, right? And that is uh, kind of nicely reflected in a survey that Fidelity ran, I think, in 2021. So a few key insights, right? 71% of all of the people who responded to the survey uh, have a plan to get exposure to digital assets. But only 3% of the respondents already had any exposure. And the group that um, you could summarize as pension funds in the US and also in Europe manage about $50 trillion worth of money. So that's a lot. Yeah? So when we talk about the 3%, I'm not talking about the 3% of the 50 trillion. I'm talking about the number of participants. Um, these, these investors cannot really buy anything if there's no standardized way of thinking about value in these platforms. Yeah? And there are... There, there is no discounted cash flow method or comparables or anything like that that we can use for companies to assess the value of these platforms. So in absence of that, the best thing that we can really do is think about the characteristics of these platforms and see whether we can learn any, anything about the platform through those characteristics. Um, let's see whether these respondents of the Fidelity um, survey care about uh, ESG, or care about sustainability. So over here you can see the, the top five um, cryptocurrencies that they named, right? Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, XRP, Bitcoin Cash, Binance Coin. So three out of the five run on proof of work, so not very environmentally friendly. Uh, Ripple has very, very high concentration of wealth, I think 
what did my slide say? 64% of total wealth on Ripple is concentrated in 100 accounts, so very concentrated. And um, as you probably know, Binance Chain has very few validators, right? So there's a governance risk associated to a collusion, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that actually means in a, in a minute. So what do we take from that? Well, people don't care about sustainability yet, yet, right? So I think as people learn about um, how sustainability comes into the world of blockchains, this will definitely change. So then this begs the question, how do we do it? Right? So let me talk a little bit about that. I have six hypotheses for you, um, and I also summed them up in this piece. I hope that the slides will be shared uh, with you eventually. You can, you can read it later. But here are my six hypotheses. So for a smart contract platform to be adoptable at very large scale, which is kind of what we're all interested in, it needs to be environmentally friendly. It also needs to be stable. As simple as that may sound, you know that not all blockchain platforms are stable. It needs to be fair. If anyone's systemically disadvantaged, I don't think that platform can fly. It also needs to have low, ideally low, but most importantly, predictable pricing. Nobody can build anything on a platform if they can't budget for their costs. Yeah? Uh, it also needs good governance. And the, I say the recent addition is I think it also needs some sort of privacy-preserving technology because we all don't want all of our financial details to be inspected by just any Tom, Dick, and Harry on the street. So let me uh, talk a little bit more about these six things individually. Uh, I'm checking time. I'm still okay, I think. Um, so environmentally friendly, you know, how, how, can you, how can you deal with that matter? Well, I think um, you can choose a platform that uses a consensus mechanism that is quite environmentally friendly. Um, as a next step, you can also calculate the CO2 emissions that are related to um, each of the transactions. And I think VeChain released something earlier this week or last week uh, in that regard. And you can also monitor what academia has to say. There are several studies that compare these different layer one platforms um, in, through that lens. Why is this important? And I'm going to tie it back to adoption here. There is now regulation in Europe that requires companies to disclose their adverse environmental impact across their entire supply chain. So what that means is that if you are Adidas and you mint an NFT collection on a proof of work blockchain, in your next earnings call, there might be an analyst that says, why did you choose this platform? Because you know you have a spike in, in CO2 emissions. So there's a regulatory driver towards uh, platform adoption of platforms that don't have that issue. Stability, we don't have to talk about all that long, but of course, if you consider these systems as operating systems, they have to be available all the time. Right? Um, if these systems become nearly as uh, important as the financial system today, then you can expect similar kind of scrutiny by regulators. Uh, I can only give you the example of the Singapore regulator who gives a four-hour grace period to a bank per year, not per month, okay, per year. So that's kind of the benchmark for uh, these platforms' availability. Platforms also have to be fair. And um, fairness is, is kind of a very philosophical topic, but we can think about it in, in a couple of ways. One is, you know, is the ecosystem uh, set up in a way that uh, wealth is distributed relatively evenly. And um, I think there's work around the Gini coefficient, and we look at this for countries and societies and so on. What's nice on blockchain, because of the current transparency, is that we can also inspect the blockchain and see uh, what the wealth distribution is. And if you think about it intuitively, right, if wealth distribution is more even, then more people have an incentive to use the platform, more people have an incentive to build on the platform, that will then attract more users. So it's kind of a, uh, a natural thing for this to be positive. Yeah? What can you do? Well, you can check that data right, on, on the blockchain directly, and you can also monitor this over time, because even though all platforms probably are way more concentrated today, you know, maybe some of them do more work to distribute wealth more evenly than others. 
we also want predictable and low pricing. So if you think about these operating systems, they're very much like a utility company, right? Like, like an energy company or, or uh, any kind of comparable firm. So you should have, it's basically a low margin business, right? You should have a very accurate price tag that is very low. And um, why is this so important? Because if anyone wants to use the platform and they never know how much they have to pay for the service, how are they supposed to create a, th a thriving business? It's almost impossible. Yeah? Um, I was just reading that because of the Silver Lake Bank issue that is uh, kind of in the news right now, um, more people start using USDC as a means of payment on Ethereum, and therefore the average transaction cost on Ethereum spiked like 5x or something. It's like, how can you build something on a platform like that? It's very difficult to, to budget uh, for, your, for your cost. Good governance is also very important. Um, you know that in uh, blockchain world, we basically remove any sort of central coordinator and replace them with validators. And then there's a couple of issues with these validators, right? They can go rogue or they can be hacked. And um, you can... Um, you can basically do something about the rogue part by making sure that there are enough of them. Right? You, only, you don't want, like, if, if basically the number of validators is low enough so that they can all get on a Zoom call, that's not a very good idea. Right? Um, but they can also uh, be hacked. So it's, looking, it's worth looking at not only how many nodes there are, but also how many companies run these nodes, right? Because if you only have let's say, four companies that run uh, the majority of the nodes, then you're not much better off, yeah? even if you have thousands of nodes. So what can you do? Well, look into these things, and then also try and understand kind of the second order information around who owns the nodes. I want to skip through this because we don't have much time. Um, I also think privacy-preserving technology is going to be extremely relevant in the future. So not only is privacy a, a human right, but also eventually it's required for our own security. You know, imagine that all your wealth information is publicly inspectable. Are you comfortable to send your kids to school? Maybe you're scared because somebody finds out, oh, you know, this guy has, has a lot in his wallet. So my take is that nobody really will build on a platform long term that doesn't have any sort of privacy protection technology enabled. So this is another kind of thing that you can look at when you select the platform to build on or when you invest. I'm trying to keep it to 12.30 and I've got five minutes. I think it should be okay. Um, I want to share a little bit about some related research that we've been doing on the sustainability characteristics of blockchains. This is a joint project with Will Kong of Cornell University and also um, Y.E. Zhang in Tsinghua in Beijing. And basically what we're doing in our paper is we're trying to understand, apart from you know, collecting some basic facts about, about our sample, we're trying to understand, is there a relationship between these sustainability characteristics and how the token uh, of the platform fares in the financial markets? And we do that in two ways. We basically take a snapshot view, and then we also see how this impact or this relevance of the sustainability characteristic impacts the token price over time. Okay? So these are the two things that we, that we check for. And um, I, I just want to, I mean, there are a few more variables, but in the interest of time, I'm going to share two. We basically have one for fairness, and then we have one for this uh, wealth concentration matter that I just mentioned. And what's interesting to see is that we do get statistically significant results for both of these as a positive contributor to the return in the financial markets. Okay? And um, what's perhaps even more interesting than just having that snapshot view is to look at how this develops over time. So I'm going to show you on the next slide a, what we call in finance a dynamic test where we basically can see that uh, as a trend over time, the contribution of this uh, wealth distribution characteristic increases. Yeah? And you can see that 
if you have lots of large token holders, there's a negative impact. And if you have lots of small token holders, there's a positive impact. I think I haven't shared this in any sort of bigger audience, so this is kind of a first. Um, we also did this for uh, our variable that tries to uh, sort of counter unfair activity on a blockchain, which is the block time, uh, especially relevant in the context of MEV. And you can see the same thing. Over time, the relevance increases. Okay? So as a, as a quick summary, and then we can go for lunch. Um, we talked a little bit about these sustainability characteristics of blockchains, or layer one blockchains in particular. And we can use, uh, we, we actually do use these also in my daily work as a, as a fund manager in, in our firm. Um, it's very important to remember that layer one platforms are like operating systems that other people can use to build upon. So they have a critical systemic role in Web3. Um, in February 2023, which is already a month ago, nine of the top 40 cryptocurrencies were smart contract platforms, commanding about a third of the market capitalization of the entire market. And that makes them uh, a very good way to kind of get macro exposure to the whole space without committing to any particular use case. Here's the, the very important thing. I pose that only sustainable platforms will be able to be broadly adopted. And it doesn't matter whether you're a, a corporation, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're just two guys in a garage building something, you will pay attention to these sustainability characteristics going forward when you pick your platform. And that has an impact on who's gonna be a winner and who's not, right? And therefore understanding what these sustainability characteristics are that are specific to blockchain platforms is very, very important in my view, okay? And with that, hey, what's going on? Ah, here. No, more, no time for Q&A, but um, I want to let you go on time, which I think I managed to do, 12.29. Um, I thank you very much for your attention, number one. Uh, also, I know that I've tried to cramp in a lot of information into a very, very short moment in time. So if you want to reach out on LinkedIn or you want to uh, talk to me later, I'll, I'll stick around a little bit. And then I thank you for your attention today, and I wish you a fantastic rest of the Hive Summit. Thank you.